Hey, and welcome back to Making Metal with Max. I'm Max Ron, and on today's episode, we're going to be talking about GMAW and what that is and what it means. All right, so stay tuned. All right, I'm back. My name is Max Ron. Uh, I teach at SAS Polytech, welding, steel fab, and innovative manufacturing. On today's episode, we're going to be getting into GMAW, or MIG as it's commonly referred to. And, uh, you know, I had big plans for GMAW because I really want to get to the end point of modified wave platforms and new technologies, right? There's lots of great new technologies coming out in the GMAW world. And they're super interesting, super fun. I've gotten to go to some fantastic training sessions from a variety of companies. And, you know, every time I get to do that type of training, my mind is blown at the new technologies and, that are emerging in the, in the steel making and welding markets. But as I started thinking about it and thinking about how I'm going to lay this out and, and for you guys and do the shows, I realized that I can't just jump into modified waveforms um, without having a pretty solid understanding of of well, of GMAW, of everything, right? So what we're going to start today, in today's episode, is we're just going to start with some basics, all right? So today's going to be the episode of basics. So for a lot of you people that are watching my shows, and I really appreciate the feedback I'm getting online, it's awesome. Um, I think you guys maybe have a pretty good understanding of uh, what's going on. I have lots of instructors and lots of people from higher levels that have been watching, sending me feedback. And uh, I think you guys, this might be a little bit, you know, you've seen it before. But for the people that uh, have never gone to school or have never taken any type of training uh, with uh, welding, this is going to be new to you guys. And I think it's very valuable. There's a couple of reasons. And, like, we're going to start with why. Okay, we always start with why in every episode. And this why has a lot to do, honestly, with just buying a machine. If you're going out to a store or a welding supply store, and you're looking at getting into buying a GMAW or a MIG setup, you're going to see that there's a wide, wide variety of machines. Uh, you can go online. There's great companies out there that cater right from the, you know, sub 100 amp machines that are, you know, usually under 150 or $200 up into the $30,000 machines that you see out there that have a, a, a massive amount of options uh, and, and variables to them. So why is that? What's the difference? Which one do I need? And a lot of shops out there that I go tour or I go do training sessions with, I'll see a variety of machines on the shop floor. There's going to be people that use certain machines and they like this machine more than that machine for this job. Why does that happen? Why can't I just pick up any machine and just make it work, right? And we're going to go over those basics as to why that is and why that isn't. Another thing that I find that happens a lot is that sometimes technology sales and uh, research and development outpaces consumer use. So what I mean by that is that there's really cool things getting invented all the time. And then they get put into machines and then they get put into a sales brochure. And then the sales guy comes to your shop or you see them at their store and they try selling you this cool new machine that's on sale because it's got all the toys and they, you know, they want to get it out in the market and you may buy it. And then you're going to get home and you're never going to use 90% of the options that machine, that machine has. And that's a waste. You know, I'm not saying that it's a waste that you shouldn't have bought the machine, but I'm saying that it's a waste that you don't know how to use it or why you would use it. You know, there's really cool things that will save you time with welding, with cleanup, with, with uh, procedural use. And you know what, even in your garage, if you're just going to be welding something small, sometimes a little bit more money spent in a better machine will give you more options as to how you can do that. All right, so that's kind of the stuff we're gonna go over. You know, what makes machines different and why? So right off the top, you may have seen me go about MIG, right? So we we use the term MIG all the time, you know, go MIG welder, I'm a MIG welder, people do MIG welding. And sometimes people look at MIG welders even as a, a lower quality or not as good of, of a welder. And you know, I hate that, let me tell you, I hate that. I've had a very varied career and for a good chunk of my career, I was a MIG welder working in a fabrication shop because MIG is fastest. It's clean. 
and it's good to use. It's got just as much strength as any other procedure or type of welding out there. All right, now the problem with MIG or GMAW welding is that people see it as easy. Now that's just an ignorant thing. And, you know, pulling a trigger is easy, but setting up a machine or knowing what you're doing may not be. And because it's got such a high deposition rate, it also has a lot of issues that can arise out of that if used improperly. All right. So if you're one of those people, get that off your plate right now. There's nothing wrong with being a MIG or GMAW welder. It's the same as TIG or stick or plasma or laser beam or whatever else you're doing out there. It's got its own set of skills and its own uses. And trust me, if I own a shop and I see a guy grabbing a whole bunch of parts to build something and he starts setting up the GTAW or TIG machine, I'm not going to keep that guy around for long because that's not going to make me money. You know, I want speed and I want quality and this is where you're going to find it. But why the two terms? Why is there two separate terms? So let's break that down. What is MIG welding? Well, MIG welding has been around for quite a while now. And we're talking about metal inert gas welding. Okay. So we have three variables here. And one that's kind of an unspoken variable, which is the arc, electricity. So we're going to be welding metals. Okay. Got it. We're going to be using an inert gas. Okay, that's key in this in this in this part here. So what's an inert gas? Well, an inert gas is going to be basically one of two right off the top. Okay, we got argon and we got helium. And if I had to present them to you visually, that's what they look like. One is big and heavy, and one is tiny and light. One is very abundant in the universe, one is not as abundant. One is recyclable one is not so recyclable because it floats okay now these terms for gases called inert means that the gas in a in a way won't react with anything now of course you push the boundaries of anything and you can cause things to happen on purpose but in, at your at your basic welding parameters both argon and helium do nothing and that's awesome we want them to do nothing our biggest issue, and we went over this in metallurgy, when we're doing any type of processing with metals, and when I'm fusion welding, I'm very much doing a process with metals, is keeping the environment out. The oxygen, the hydrogen, the nitrogen, right? These are bad things that are in our environment that'll get sucked into a weld and cause problems. Well, the easiest way for me to keep those things away is to have another gas displace them. So what these guys will do is displace. They're not going to be a part of the party. So if I got my welding party here, argon's coming in. I got oxygen, nitrogen, and everything else in here. All they're doing is pushing these guys out, and then argon's going to take over, right? And that's why argon is actually used so often, because of its size and weight. If you look at the periodic table, I think argon's like 17. I think aluminum is like 90. Like, I mean, it's a big, heavy atom. You know, and that's a good thing because it's inert. So it's like that big bouncer. They don't get involved, but they're just there to make sure nothing goes down. All right. So that's what's happening with argon. It's bouncing the weld. It's saying, you know what? You guys stay out of here environment. We're going to let the electricity and the metals do their thing. And argon's just going to make sure that everyone stays away. Okay. Now, it's good because it's cheap. It's very abundant. And in its, in its own way, it's fairly recyclable because it's a non-consumable, which means I'll pour argon out of my nozzle and it'll spill onto the table, roll onto the floor, and then go back into nature to be recaptured another day, right? Now, helium is way different. Helium is also inert, but it's tiny. It's a tiny little molecule. It's number two on the periodic table. There's only one thing smaller, and that's hydrogen, all right? So helium doesn't have that bouncer mentality. It doesn't come in like a big brute to push guys out of the way. What helium does is it takes power and pressure in numbers. It's like having 300 ninjas show up instead of one giant bouncer, right? So in my house party here now of welding, I have my all these little guys in here, which is my nitrogens, hydrogens, and oxygens. And then I have a busload of helium come in and push its way in. And it'll kick everybody out and replace it with helium. Now, again, helium is an is a inert gas, which means it's not going to play with the other guys. They're not friendly. They won't join or become a part of any equation. They just push people out. 
Now helium is good in some ways because what's, used, what's a better way to fill a jar? With sand or with big rocks? Well, you're only going to get one or two big rocks in a jar, but you'll get millions of sand and you'll get the corners better. So helium has a, a better displacement ratio, but you must have a higher pressure. All right. Now, helium is also very expensive. Why is that? Well, helium is not so renewable. Helium is a byproduct of gases that are made underground. And as we tap into them and release them, they now we use them. They go up into the atmosphere where they get ch changed by our, our uh, atmosphere, our ionosphere. And then we don't have them anymore. Helium is gone. All right, so that makes it expensive because it's going to run out. In fact, right now, helium on the planet is running out. There are consortiums about helium talking about what are we going to do when the helium is gone, right? You may notice that there's not many more helium balloons at the dollar store anymore. Now they're just plastic balls on sticks because helium is expensive and it's hard to get. There's only a couple uses for it in the professional world, mainly medical machinery like MRIs and CAT scans use helium as an insulator for electromagnetic waves, hence inert gas insulation, right? And in welding, inert gas insulation, right? Same reasons. Science is science. So we got our two gases that we use, and they're both inert. So we talked about that here. We have our inert gas and then gas welding, which they go together. Now, of course, these are electric. So there's an electric arc that we're using for a heat source for this. That's what's making it all happen. So, this was the way it was for a long time. But then things started to change, okay? And what changed between MIG and GMAW is in, is in the terms themselves. So now let's look at this. We got gas. We got metal, right? We got arc. And we got welding. Okay, so arc welding. Gas, metal, arc welding. Well, we don't have the term inert in here anymore. Why not? Well, because we don't just use inert gases anymore. That's the big change. Now, as we evolved our sciences, our gases changed. We now have inert, which is our argon and our helium, right? And now we have active gases, okay? And now most active gases, not all, okay? I'm just I'm keeping this simple. Most active gases will have some type of O2 base, whether it's CO2, O2, uh, CO, carbon monoxide, or some version of oxygen involved in there to make it active. And you're going to be thinking, well, what the heck did we learn these last six lessons? You've been telling us the whole time we got to get oxygen out of the party. Oxygen's not cool. It's not, it's not good for welding. And you're telling me now that we're going to start putting oxygen in the weld. Why the heck would I do that? Well, I'll tell you why. What does oxygen do to fire? If we push it in, hmm? you got your campfire, or you're trying to start your barbecue and you blow on it. Whew, although most of our expelling is CO2, but you know, we have some oxygen left in there. So if we push oxygen, push it into a flame or a fire, what happens is the temperatures increase. Okay. So I can make things hotter with oxygen. So in this world with MIG, the only way for me to make the weld hotter is to increase the amperage. Well, in GMAW world, I have now two options. I can increase the weld heat by amperage, which is an overall encapsulating heat, or I can have at the point of contact increase in heat, which can get used because active gases get used and then they're gone right? And at that point of contact, I'll have a small burst or increase of heat due to the oxygen, okay? Now, this opens up a world of possibilities, right? Because before, we would just have to turn up amps, turn up amps, turn up amps, and the whole thing's going to get hot. Remember, there's pathways of electricity going in every direction. There's grains involved. There's electromagnetic fields that get to arc blow. We have all these problems with having too much arc current flow, right? Now, if I can subvert some of that issue by just creating more heat at the point without electricity, well, now I can do a wider variety of controlled welds, especially in the world of alloys, all right? And that's awesome. Deposition rates, boom. You can increase the deposition rate 
not by having a bigger wire or more electricity, but by just increasing a little bit of the oxygen in there. Or I can have nice wet edges. And that's one of the easiest places to see the use of oxygen in a weld is the, is the wet edges of a weld. Because the oxygen that's coating the weld and the heat inside of there from the arc, from the electricity, causes the electricity to, or sorry, the oxygen to increase the weld temperature just in that zone, which causes the edges to fuse so much nicer to the, to the actual parent metal. Now, this is still problematic. If I have oxygen in my weld, we've learned that it's going to lead to porosity or types of issues that have to do with oxygen inclusions in the well, right? So why can we do it now? Well, it wasn't because we invented new gases so much that made the big difference. The biggest difference in the world of GMAW was with the filler metal or the electrode, okay? Now this is metallurgy, which we talked extensively about, okay? And I, honestly, I could have done five more shows because I really felt like I was trying to wrap it up. But yeah, there's so much information. But the metallurgy of the filler wires changed. We got better at creating deoxidizers. Okay? And a deoxidizer is an element, a mineral, or an, uh, an alloy that I can add to my wire, my ferrous metal, that will consume oxygen. Okay? Now that's a game changer. Silicon mixed with oxygen pulls it out of the weld. So if I add a little bit of silicon to a weld, to the, to the filler metal, I can then add a little bit of oxygen to the gas. So I can add a little bit in column A to deal with a little bit of column B. And the column B is giving me a better weld and the column A is really not going to make a difference because it will float out. Right? So the biggest changes were in the metals we're using as filler metals. By having a wider variety of metal filling options, deoxidizers, stabilizers, all these things, we were then now be able to go back and start playing with the gases. Now this became a science. It is a science. It's very complex. And for purchasing, it's complex because now these guys got a match, right? If I buy a filler metal, it'll be an ER70S-something. Right, And then it'll tell me, that wire will say, this wire is meant to be used with so-and-so gas, which will be a 75% argon, 25% uh, uh, CO2, right? And it'll be some type of mix. There's binary gases, which is two gases. And then there's trimix or multi-mix gases, which will be three or four types of gases, where it could be argon, helium, oxygen, CO2, any type of mixes of these, right? Now, in order to have a mixed gas, I have to use the right wire. If I use the wrong wire and then use a mixed gas, I will then have hydrogen, argon, nitrogen, or oxygen issues in my weld. Okay? So that's a big difference. Does MIG welding still exist? Yes. I can go buy just a bottle of argon, and I can go buy a, bottle or a, a, a box of wire, and that wire is meant, designed, to run on a purely inert gas, and at that point, technically, I am MIG welding. I'm using a metal, I'm using an inert gas, and I'm welding. MIG, right? Now, you are going to be hard-pressed to find that situation in today's world. 99% of the welds out there are GMAW. And that's the proper term. Because if you're not using a pure argon or a pure helium, you're not MIG welding. You're doing some version of GMAW. All right? Okay. So let's move on. We got our MIG. Or GMAW weld. Okay, we talked a little about about in, a little bit about inert gases versus active gases or reactive gases. Now, a reactive gas will react to an element or heat like oxygen. It'll react to heat and, and create a higher heat. Right? It'll make the fire bigger. Argon, not so much. It'll snuff the fire. And, and, and argon's heavy. Remember, it drops to the ground. Helium floats up. Argon's cheap. Helium's expensive. Base your buying on that. Okay. Now, the next thing we need to talk about is the arc part. We talked about the gases. We talked about the metals, right? So those are covered. But we haven't really talked about the arcs or power sources. Okay, this gets a little tricky. And we'll probably have to just get through a little bit of power sources here and then call it an episode. And then I'll have to continue because this can get pretty big. 
and it's actually fairly important to know what you're doing, especially on the lower end of welders where you may be looking to buy a welder for your garage. I have two welding machines in my garage right now that are both GMAW welding machines. One's a multi-process, one's just a straight GMAW. I've used them both extensively and they're very different and they have very different power sources and they're very different places where I can use them, all right? So let's break this down right to the start. And where do we start? Power in our wall. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start with our power, okay? So we've got our power outlet coming out from the wall. Now, one of the things about a power outlet is that we have what here in Canada, 120 volts, and we have about 20 amps, okay? Now that's important to note because we have voltage and amperage. What does that mean? Volts equal pressure and amps equal heat or current. So we have a part of the electrical current that is a heat generator and then the part that's the push. All right, now it's important to know how important pressure is. In our homes, we have high voltage and we have low amperage. Why is that? Well, because if I exceed over 20 amps, I'm going to blow the breaker because I'm going to start a fire. Remember, amps is heat. So if I go more than the amperage recommended for the wiring or the breaker or any of the equipment, that stuff is going to start off fire. And we can't have that happen. Now, in terms of voltage, that's way different. Voltage doesn't start fires. Voltage is the ability to push or the pressure of the electrical current. So in terms of pressure, think about it this way. I have a 100-pound rock. How much force do I need to move a 100-pound rock? Well, I need at least 101 pounds of pressure to move it. If I have less than that, it ain't going to move. So in voltage, I want a high pressure to push things a long way. And that's important because we need voltage. We need electricity in our house, in our neighborhoods, in our cities, in our countries, in the world. And where does it come from? The dam, the nuclear reactor, the coal mine, all these different places that pump power into our little outlets in our house have to travel thousands of miles sometimes. And the only way that's going to happen is with a high pressure system. All right. So the pressure, the voltage is what gets us to our house and the amperage is what creates heat. Okay. This system is also an alternating current system, which means that there's really no plus and minus. There's no anode or cathode. It's really just back and forth, 60 times a second in Canada, 50 times a second in other parts of the world. And every country has their own regulations on the voltage and amp available through their systems. But then that filters down through all the wiring codes, the electrical codes, and everything else. Okay? So at this point, can we weld? Can we? Not a, not a chance. Not a chance. This amperage is way too low to, to melt steel. We need heat. Right? Welding is about heat. We need lots of heat. So the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to change that up. And that's a transformer. A transformer transforms the, the high voltage, low amperage to high amperage, low voltage. Okay? So here we go. Transformer. Now that transformer system is what we used to call your buzz box. Now, I have a buzz box in my garage. It's awesome. I love it. I've had it like 30 years. Still welds great. But I have to buy equipment and filler materials, electrodes for it that are specific to AC because a buzz box is still an alternating current machine. That's the buzzing that you're hearing is that when I'm welding with it is the AC power flipping back and forth. And the funny thing is, is that on the front of my AC buzz box machine that I've had for 30 years, there's a line that says negative and a line that says positive, but they're completely baloney. Okay. They don't really mean that because it's alternating and I can't, I could can switch them. It won't matter. Right now at this point, can I weld? Yes. Yes. I can weld. I have enough amperage to melt whatever steel I need. And I have enough voltage for my little system, right? Just from the box to my hand, to the material and back that little cycle. I have enough voltage to make that happen. Okay, and keep in mind that that voltage is what jumps the gap when I'm welding, right? So when I'm welding, there's a gap between my filler metal. It's called the arc length, right? We're going to get more into that, but that arc length, you need voltage to jump that gap, right? So we have everything we need here to weld out of our transformer. But hey, it's not great. An alternating current's not great. 
and it's hard to use and you can't get real hot. It's there's some problems with it because it's not a direct enough heat, right? When we need direct heat, what we need is direct current. Okay? We need to get from there to there. Okay? How do we do that? Well, you go through a process called a rectifier. I'll type it up here, rectifier. So what does a rectifier do? Well, a rectifier creates polarity. Basically what you're doing is that you're taking that sine wave, okay, so over here AC does this, right? And there's two of them, so one's going one way, one's going the other. Well, DC levels those out. Now I have a negative and a positive, okay? So in DC world, I now have a plus and a minus. I have polarity. I have high, uh, sorry, amperage, low voltage. This is very much a great welding machine. This is probably most welding machines out there. And well, in reality, as you scale up, you keep the components. It's not like you just abandon the other one. Inside every rectifier, there's a transformer. And to every transformer, there's a power outlet or a power source, whether it be an engine, gas-driven engine or a diesel-driven engine. There's a, few, there's a power source that feeds to a transformer of some kind. And a, in the old days, it would just be a transformer giving you your welding power. Now, you now move up to a rectifier where now you have polarities. Okay? Now, those polarities are awesome. I can have electrode positive. So here's my stinger with my electrode. And here's my return. And now I have my cycle. And I can now weld. And these are nice welds. I have way more controls. Okay? Now, between here and here, a little tiny invention, invention, the diode. Okay? So the diode helps create pathways. I'm not going to get more into that than I have to. But basically, in the to get from AC to DC, you have to split it up. Right? You basically had one wide path, and now you're going to say, no. You guys go that way. All you happy guys, the pluses go that way. And all you negative guys, all you unhappy mofos, you guys go that way. Okay, and we're going to use you guys differently because when we get out of the welding machine, I'm going to store you in this house called the welding machine. And when I let you escape to do this thing called welding, you guys are going to go in a certain order, right? And it's always going to be negative to positive. It's always going to be the negatives chasing the positives down. And that's the cycle, regardless of what we're using it for. And different welding processes use different cycles or direction of travel of electricity. Now, this opens up a lot of things. The rectifier, now we have TIG welding. We have now uh, lots of other forms of polarities for flux cores, for MIG wires, for sub arcs. We can start playing with, you know, either bead penetration or bead width profiles. All these things are available to us because we're able to control the pluses and the minuses of the weld. Okay? But did it stop there? Hell no. Right? Hell no. We kept going. After this little invention that allowed for the rectifiers to be created, you know, the diodes and the pathways, we had a little thing called an SCR, which is a silicon controlled rectifier. Okay, and what that does is that creates for us a thing called an inverter. Now, you'll buy a welding machine today. Most of the time now, you're going to be buying some form of inverter. And the biggest giveaway when you're looking at inverters, I guess two biggest giveaways, is one, price. Inverters tend to be more expensive. Oh, well, that's changing drastically now. And two is size. Okay? In order for all these to exist, there was always an underlying issue. And that was the loss of power through grounding. Okay? Every system here, there's a little ground there, there's a ground here, there's a ground here. All these machines have a ground that goes back out the outlet and into the wall that can get spiked into your copper pipe in your house that goes into the ground. Why do we need that? Well, for power surges or unused power reservoirs. Inside of all of these, there's a storage unit of electricity that holds power. Now, that relates to a thing called duty cycle that refers to the amount of amperage maximum amperage OCV which is open current voltage right so all these things relate to how much power it can store before you get going now that's a physical space in your welding machine physically storing lightning in a jar for you okay now if up until here you did not use the power or did not have a place for that power to go or something were to go wrong that power would get dumped Okay, now the SCR is basically like a diode. So here's our little diode. 
You guys ever open a circuit board, you see that little diode looking thing? Power can only go one way, okay? This is the old system here. And when I say old, it's still out there, but it's just, there's newer. Now, it can go out one way, that creates our positive. If something ever tries to come back, it gets dumped into the ground, or if it's big enough surge, the diode bursts. And then you're taking it out to get fixed, right? You're calling your buddy Dave at DTEC and saying, hey, Dave, my welder blew up. And he comes and checks it out and says, hey, you know what? Some of these dials blew up. Uh, we're going to have to change the motor, change the board because there was a power surge, okay? Now, SCRs are different. SCR-based machines are inverters. What happens, a little diode, is that you have something called a gate, okay? Now, that's very important in this system because what happens is that power goes through, and if something says no, if some type of the equation, if A equals B is not C, then what happens is that the power gets redirected back into the system. Now, that efficiency is huge. So if you don't use the power, it goes back to the power capacitor, back to the storage unit to be reused. Now, that immediately made the size shrink right down because you're not using or wasting power. On top of that, along this path, you can have a variety of SCRs and dials and new pathways, and each one of these will be options, option, option, A, B, C, D. Do you want to go here, 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 here? Now it's not just yes or no. You go to an old rectifier machine, you got DC plus, DC negative, and then you may have CC or CD, and that's it. And those are actual panel switches that are like chunk power that way could chunk power that way and that's all it would do it would still dump it into the ground if you didn't use it now on an inverter now you have hey what do you want to do go grab your you know your mpa miller and you got tig tig negative you stick soft crisp you have i don't know uh high frequency this low uh, touch start what i'm saying is you got a ton of variables on a dial that dial is related to this Okay? It's the ability to shift power around without loss and use it in different ways. Even stack it, move it, shift it, have different frequencies, go back to AC. Now, I can jump back and I can go back to AC power out of my welder and have a switch to go to AC, DC, plus, negative, whatever. The SCR or the inverter machines allow you to do that. Now, in terms of GMAW, if you're buying an inverter machine, you're probably buying a, a multi-processor. You have MIG, stick, TIG, plasma, whatever. All these options are available because of that. If you're just getting your little MIG only machine, like it's just a little MIG only, 150 bucks, you're probably buying this. It's got no switches, no ability to change. So why would they over-engineer that? They don't. Now that's not, I can't stick weld with that GMAW one purpose machine. It is what it is. Now, the difference in price between that and that can be $1,000. But this $1,000 machine can do what all of the predecessors could do. That's nice. All right? Now, the new tech is great. Now, to just take this a little bit further, because the train doesn't stop there, right? Inside of here, things happen now. Now that we have the ability to change things, these SCRs allowed for options. Now, another thing that happens in the world of electricity, aside from pressure and heat, is time. We think of electricity being like, well, the speed of light. Yeah, the speed of light's pretty fast. You know, like, I, I don't think I can run the speed of light. I might be able to eat a walk the speed of light, but I don't think I can run it. Now, that still is time. And lots of the new machines now, you'll see a thing called IGBT. What the heck is that? Insulated gate bipolar transistor. What the heck does that mean? Well, you don't need to know what it means, but I tell you what it does. This is fast decisions. Okay? So an SCR can help you make decisions and options, but it had a certain speed allotted to it. And it could only make, say, and I'm just making this number up, so don't call me and yell at me that I got it wrong, just for example. But let's say an SCR can make 100 decisions a second. So if I'm going to play with a wave or a power form or any type of power system, let's say I can make 100 choices per second and I can't exceed that. That'll limit what I can do. 
especially when light is the speed of light. A hundred decisions per second can be an eternity if you're them moving that fast. Well, an, an IGBT system has ramped that up to say 10,000 decisions per second. And with the new IGBT systems, now you're seeing some real fine tuning. You're talking about synergic systems. You're talking about wave modifications. You're talking about amplitude modifications. You're talking about specific points of a specific part of an electrical wave during the ramping up or burning off or whatever it is being controlled to the microsecond, okay? Now that's when you get into some really, really cool stuff. And this, this combination is how we get into the modified waveforms, which we're gonna be aiming to and getting to at the end of the show.